Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Rick Nabb. Uh, Dr. Nabb is uh, uh, the director of the National Hurricane Center. Uh, you may uh, very well recognize him from his uh, stint at the Weather Channel as the tropical weather expert. Uh, but Dr. Nabb has a whole history of working with the National Weather Service uh, prior to going to the Weather Channel. Uh, he was uh, deputy director of the Central Pacific Hurricane Center uh, in uh, Hawaii and before that uh, was a forecaster and worked his way uh, up to senior forecaster at the National Hurricane Center uh, before that. So, so uh, like uh, many broadcast meteorologists here in the room uh, that you've lived, eat, and breathe uh, television weather, uh, Dr. Nab has uh, lived, eat, and breathe uh, tropical meteorology and uh, is a, uh, a welcome addition to the National Hurricane Center and I'm sure has great vision for where he wants to take it over the next uh, several years. So um, I have a short little video introduction uh, for Dr. Nab that I'd like to play. And uh, after that, uh, uh, Dr. Nab will get right into his presentation, and then we'll have all the questions uh, there. So with that, let's take a look at the short little video. I want people to realize that hurricanes pose multiple hazards. We often tend to focus on the wind, and everybody often thinks first about what can I do to protect myself, my house, or what actions can I take to protect myself from the wind, and that's certainly critical. You have to have the proper window coverings for your home, and you're going to want to take shelter in a well-constructed home that has the proper window coverings, but you also have to think about whether or not the place you're going to stay during a hurricane is vulnerable to flooding from multiple sources. Complacency is a big, big problem. C consider the fact that the United States coastline has not experienced the landfall of a major hurricane that's Category 3 or stronger on the Saffir Simpson hurricane wind scale since 2005, Hurricane Wilma. So we are pushing seven years since that has happened. Certainly we've had major impacts from storms like Irene and Ike and Lee, but there are many places, not only have they not received a significant hurricane in the last seven years, they haven't received one in the last Don't 70 years be focusing on the exact center of, of this hurricane because it is so large, it is going to be impacting a lot of people beginning well before the center eventually comes ashore in the mid-Atlantic northeast area and lasting long time thereafter. Let's take a look at the forecast path, and for those of you uh, just on audio, uh, what we're going to see is this continued northeastward motion today over relatively warm water, so there is this uh, uh, fuel for the system to maintain its intensity for the next day as a tropical cyclone, and then uh, it will bend around to the northwest over cooler waters, but because it will be feeling the influence of non-tropical energy in the atmosphere, it will we anticipate it will be able to maintain some intensity as it makes the transition to a post-tropical cyclone uh, and that is not necessarily going to impact what kind of hazards are experienced. This will be a long duration event so the, the water levels uh, could ebb and flow a little bit over multiple tidal cycles but with the peak of uh, 6 to 11 feet perhaps occurring especially if the highest surge occurs at around the, the time of the highest tide. Uh, because we're anticipating this transition from tropical to post-tropical, uh, the area north of North Carolina is being handled with non-tropical warnings. But uh, just to give you an idea, we are expecting uh, hurricane force winds in coastal areas, the northern Delmarva, the middle and upper Chesapeake Bay, uh, the coast of uh, 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 New Jersey, the Delaware Bay, uh, Long Island, the New York City area, Connecticut, Rhode Island coastlines, all of these areas were expecting hurricane force winds and so this is going to be just as impactful in terms of the strength of the wind as if it were a fully tropical hurricane. Uh, rainfall totals could reach a foot. This is going to be a flooding potential well inland and a wind potential going well inland for several days into the middle of the week. Who was that guy? <laughs> uh, nice to see a lot of familiar faces here this morning, Samantha and Jim and, and John, and uh, we've got some Weather Service colleagues, and we've been making our way around the country, it seems, uh, where we were in Austin, Texas um, last week for the AMS annual meeting, and as, uh, as Chris mentioned, we had the opportunity to meet with a lot of students. We had an opportunity to uh, engage with the scientific community, <clears throat> everybody involved in all aspects of meteorology 
And a lot of those discussions came back around to how does this apply to the real world? And what, especially the students want to know this, what am I going to be doing in my career with all this weather study that I could be doing, all this research that I could be doing? What am I going to be doing that's going to uh, change something for the better? Something that's going to impact the public? And the, the students are starting to do a lot of dual majors. They want to do meteorology and business, meteorology and sociology, meteorology and GIS. And it's, it's really becoming uh, widely known all the way from our level and above and our level down to the students that it's not just about the weather anymore. Uh, so I'm going to use the 2012 hurricane season to talk a little bit about that because along the way I'll talk to you about some product development we've been doing, some challenges we've faced in the past, even this year in communicating the hazards, uh, the, the difficulties in uh, making evacuation decisions, as was just mentioned, that we are heavily involved with in, in communicating with the emergency managers. And I, I really hope that, that folks can take away from this that we learn from every storm, we learn from every season, we learn from every past event on how to do better. And in fact, we were doing a lot of the things prior to the 2012 hurricane season that are going to benefit us based on what happened this year because think of the cyclones that impacted the U.S. this year and you'll probably remember that it was just about all about water, water, water. And as we go through the season uh, history here you'll see and remind yourself about how much water played a role. And you know this year we had an above average number of storms and hurricanes, 19 and 10 respectively, below the average number of major hurricanes. Uh, we're still doing our post-event analysis of Sandy. It's at least possible that that could be upgraded to a major hurricane down the Caribbean, but in any event, that, it, that analysis still is ongoing. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, lots of numbers, but what really matters? Jim, we talk about this at the Weather Channel all the time. Uh, all that matters is the one that impacts you. And uh, a lot of folks had that one this year. Uh, the accumulated cyclone energy, about 40% above the 30-year median, so there was a lot of activity. That's the combined strength and duration of the cyclone. So overall, a busy year. Technically, one hurricane landfall in the U.S., that was Isaac. Sandy made landfall with borderline hurricane force winds. Again, we're still doing that post-event analysis. The uh, operational designation was as post-tropical. We haven't yet seen any data to tell us to change that designation at landfall. But in any event, the... Uh, the, the size, the strength, the surge generating potential of that system was known well before landfall and it came to fruition. I'll, I'll show you some of the impacts. And as a result of Isaac, Sandy, even somewhat Debbie, little bit barrel, even before the season uh, began, which was, by the way, the last hurricane I covered at the Weather Channel. <laughs> I did barrel and then I went down, then I d uh, packed up the car and drove down to the hurricane center. Uh, barrel, by the way, was the uh, strongest pre-season landfalling tropical cyclone in U.S. records. So we were off to kind of a busy start. Uh, so overall, likely the second costliest season on record for the U.S. after 2005, a season I remember very well, my first full year as a hurricane specialist down at the Hurricane Center. We had a number of relatively weak cyclones, including Debbie. Debbie was relatively weak by wind, but we'll, sh we'll remind ourselves that it had very significant, especially water, impacts. And a lot of systems were out in the northeastern Atlantic. You see where all the red lines are, a lot of it out to sea and well away from the U.S. Uh, comparatively fewer systems closer to the U.S., but those are the ones that had all the impacts. Uh, and if we look at the list of storms for the year, uh, I, I show you this just to highlight uh, the storms Debbie, Ernesto, Isaac, Sandy, uh, that really had the most uh, impacts in terms of casualties. Uh, again, still going through these numbers. Uh, and, and you see how early the season began with Alberto and Beryl and how late the season ran. So this, again, a, a very busy year. But you take all of these storms off the list and you just leave the one that impacted your area and that's all it requ that's required to make for a bad year. Overall, the forecasts were pretty good this year. Our track verification uh, shows that it, the numbers in the green there under track uh, show that we have... Uh, record-setting track forecast errors uh, this year. So the errors continue to come down. 
uh, in track as that's been the trend over the last many years. Intent <coughs> excuse me, our intensity forecast errors were actually overall below average. Part of the reason for that, though, admittedly, was that we didn't have a whole lot of rapidly intensifying cyclones. Uh, again, this the, is this the one major hurricane declared operationally, so that made the intensity forecast not quite as difficult. When something doesn't go from 100 to 150 knots in, in a day, uh, that will lessen your forecast errors. Uh, just looking at the track guidance, just very briefly, just wanted to show how the, the official forecast errors uh, still uh, very competitive with most of the models, and in fact, the, uh, the GFS in the royal blue line there uh, had uh, overall the best year. But each model has its good and bad day, <coughs> and the uh, European model did very well on both uh, Sandy and Isaac. Uh, just briefly, track model trends, the GFS overall, uh, the best model for the entire year, but that's over a lot of storms, and if you look at individual uh, systems, you know, the, uh, the model that does the best uh, can change. But we certainly have a lot of very competitive models uh, that we utilize in our forecast. We continue to use this ensemble approach uh, in making our forecast. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, Jim's asking, do we have uh, a habit of looking at how the model has been doing on this particular storm to yeah, give us an idea? All right. The, yeah, the, Jim's question it has to do with whether or not we are looking at how good a model has done up to this point in this year, how good it does at three days, does it do better on three days, another model does better at five days. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a real good signal from each individual model that this is going to be the best in this particular scenario. Uh, it's just not that clear, and so we still really hang our hat heavily on the, on the ensemble approach. Uh, but <clears throat> there are times when we do get the sense that a particular model is handling this particular storm fairly well. We might lean a little bit in that direction, but it's not something we can really hang our hat on. That ensemble approach of taking the best models and kind of splitting the difference, because they all tend to have their biases one way or another, it seems to be the best approach. Uh, so despite the overall superior performance by the GFS, the European model did very well in a couple of particular storms. And uh, the GFS was very useful in forecasting the strength and size of Sandy. Uh, that was a big part of what went into our storm surge forecast uh, for Sandy. Uh, a lot of slow moving storms, those you can rack up some, uh, some smaller forecast errors because, <coughs> excuse me, because if it's, going, if it's here and in five days it's going to be here and you forecast it to be here, you're probably going to get pretty close. Uh, but they're not all that way. A lot of them accelerate and you rack up the large errors that way. Uh, and I mentioned before that a lot of the storms failed to rapidly intensify. One thing we're doing that the emergency management community has been very enthusiastic about us moving toward is extending our tropical weather outlook, the forecast of potential formation of tropical cyclones beyond the current two days out to five days. And we continue to do that internally this year, and the verification looks pretty good in terms of the verifying percentage and the forecast percentage when we convey the chance that a system is going to become a tropical cyclone within a five-day period. Uh, basically saying if we say it's a 30 percent chance, it forms about 30 percent of the time. So we are going to experimentally, publicly, this coming year, that's the plan anyway, uh, to, to make available these five-day Genesis forecasts. Uh, so you'll start seeing that sometime this hurricane season. And that uh, will, if we do it graphically, which we hope we will, that will paint an area in which the system is expected to form, which can give folks, including the emergency managers and the media, heads up. I remember when I was at the Weather Channel, a lot of times uh, I talked about the, th the two-day chance of something forming, and then I had to you know, remind the public that, well, even though the Hurricane Center is only forecasting out to two days, it has opportunity beyond that time to form. So uh, for systems that form on our doorstep, like Umberto 2007, for example, uh, this will be a very beneficial uh, service enhancement. Okay, so let's go to some of the storms. Uh, Debbie doesn't look like a whole lot when you look at the track and the intensity. Relatively weak tropical storm in the Gulf of Mexico, but the action was not near the center. The action was well away from the center uh, and, pr and produced a bunch of rainfall. You know, Dave Novak from HPC here, they provided us a, a rainfall graphic showing uh, well over 20 inches of rain in a number of locations, leading to a lot of inland flooding. So just a tropical storm 
is not a phrase I utter too often because the tropical storms, when they're large and sprawling and don't move much, <coughs> excuse me, uh, large and sprawling and don't move much, uh, the rainfall totals can really rack up. I can show you examples from lots of different counties in Florida, but this is just one example in Pinellas County of the inland flooding that occurred. Uh, the forecast challenge was tremendous, and this is where the media and emergency managers and we all feel like we want to pull our hair out because when reliable models, European going left and GFS going right, for example, are going completely opposite directions, it really makes the decision making more difficult for the emergency managers, it makes communicating the hazards more difficult, certainly makes our forecast more difficult. Uh, in this particular case, the GFS generally had the right idea of it eventually going to the right. Eventually, the models all agree when you get closer to uh, the time that it actually happens. But that poses, that just shows you how difficult decision making can be when the forecast guidance, guidance from reliable models is all over the place. One thing we did <coughs> uh, during Debbie this year uh, was to in our storm surge unit, start to test some things that we've already been showing to some of the social scientists, others in the weather service, some emergency managers, some media folks. Uh, this is a new product that's under development, not yet uh, sent out to the public, but something that we have been uh, working on in a GIS environment and getting the mechanics of it working during this past hurricane season so that hopefully, maybe this coming season, we could disseminate something like this publicly. And this, to me, is one really good example of how the Weather Ready Nation and Decision Support Services work. There's a lot of components here. There's product development. You are engaging the user community prior to making the product final and public. You're getting their feedback. You're iterating with them. You're testing it ahead of time. And then we are already beginning a social science uh, effort to begin the outreach and education component of this product and a potential storm surge warning that I'll talk to you in a little bit. But this was intended to do the groundwork on the technical part of it, to see if we could actually generate this in real time. But this is something that is a, a peek into the not so distant future of new products that could graphically convey the potential for storm surge flooding above ground level in ways that matter more to people. How deep could the water get where I live? How far inland could it penetrate from the coastline? A, a, a big service enhancement, we think, uh, for decision support, primarily, and communication on the storm surge hazard, rather, rather than what we have all resorted to, either text or drawing a strip along the coastline. So this is something we're working on. Isaac was a large, relatively sloppy system throughout in almost an, its entire life. Uh, this is just one snapshot on August 27th, and if you look at where the tropical storm is centered over the Gulf of Mexico, you might think, well, okay, this is the stage at which the impacts to Florida were about over. Not so fast. If you look at that red over Lake Okeechobee on the southeastern part of Florida, that was where this trailing band a very heavy rainfall was occurring and led to inland flooding over western Palm Beach County. This is not picture you saw all over South Florida, <coughs> but it is a very significant impact to a tropical storm where the center passed far away from this location. And again, all about water. And this is a challenge to convey to folks and to get folks to react and plan for a hazard that might be very localized, but very, very impactful. We were saying, generally speaking, I think all of us in the Weather Service and on television, that there's still a flash flood potential here as Isaac goes by, but we couldn't pinpoint where it was going to occur. That's a big challenge. Radar loop for Isaac, just to give you a reminder of, again, that's not your classic eye. It's not a very uh, well-defined uh, uh, system, but large and slow moving and only became a hurricane just before uh, making landfall, so it was only a hurricane in a very short amount of time. And I remember being on television talking to a number of media outlets, and I just kept saying, water, let's focus on water. At the time that officials were making very difficult emergency management evacuation decisions, it was still a tropical storm. That just goes to show you how size and slow motion can really help to uh, ramp up the system's potential to produce a significant storm surge. Uh, this was one of those cases where I wish that we had that new tool we've been working on for a while, a storm surge warning, because the wind warning uh, was not going to capture uh, the 
location and timing of the storm surge. The, the wind and water don't occur all at the same times and same places. And at one point when the system went inland and then clearly weakened below hurricane back to tropical storm, protocol would be to bring down the hurricane warning, go back to tropical storm warning. And eventually we had to do that. Uh, but I would still like to have had a, uh, a storm surge warning up uh, for those locations. But we are moving in that direction. I'll talk about that when I finish. Uh, just to some ideas of how deep the water got in some places, uh, more than 15 feet uh, in parts of southeastern Louisiana. And even the coast of Louisiana had to evacuate uh, eight, nine feet in many places. Again, very difficult evacuation decisions when it's a borderline tropical storm and hurricane. Uh, but we were uh, uh, engaging the emergency managers directly. And that's, if you want to talk about decision support services, that's someone from the weather service on the phone or in person with someone from an emergency management agency. And they're talking back and forth, perhaps multiple times over many, many hours, wrangling over the ins and outs of something, especially when it's borderline in their location. These evacuation decisions are not easy, but we're there to walk people through it. It's not just a collection of products, it's a personal interaction that really drives evacuation decisions in many cases. So finally, Sandy, uh, this is a radar loop. Uh, we'll show you uh, over many, many hours here. This is still very early in the morning on the 29th, so you don't see the center of circulation yet. Uh, but as it comes into view here on the bottom right, you see the center of circulation there. Uh, but we start to lose any indication of, a, of an eye or an inner core. There just was not. Uh, at about now, when it came ashore, an inner core with thunderstorm activity around it. But it was still a very, very large system capable of pushing a lot of water into the coastline. And we said for days and days and days, moving up uh, to the time of landfall, that regardless of what kind of system Sandy was going to be, and we were forecasting this transition to post-tropical uh, for many days in advance, and uh, anticipated that would happen offshore, and it did, not by a whole lot, but it did and at least operationally designated. We were saying despite what kind of system it is or what it might look like, the hazards were still going to be very, very impactful. And the, those discussions about storm surge forecasts and evacuation decisions went on for days and days and days uh, leading up to the event. Uh, we did all of the things we would normally do for a hurricane even though this was forecast to no longer be fully tropical by the time it got to the coast. When all was said and done, we had uh, peak water levels, the surge and tide combined. This is above mean high or high water based on gauges. It's basically a proxy for inundation above ground level. How deep probably did the water get near the coastline? And you see the eight and nine feet uh, near New York City, five to eight feet in many other places. Uh, we did a helicopter tour with FEMA after the fact. Uh, this is just one example of an area miles and miles and miles of coastline directly and severely impacted by storm surge and waves. Waves were a huge part of the Jersey story because uh, it wasn't water coming in and then waves on top of that. It was more waves just pounding and pounding and pounding on the shoreline. And the water level kept coming up. It was really the wave action that did the damage. If you look closely though, you look at some of the roofs, even in the after pictures, uh, here on the right and on the bottom left, the shingles are mostly intact. It was not much of a wind event by comparison to the storm surge and the wave event. So this is yet another, never mind what kind of wind warning was or wasn't in effect. Because, I mean, there were wind warnings, just not the traditional hurricane warning. Regardless, the ideal for this kind of situation in the future is the storm surge warning. So that we are warning for the hazard that did most of the damage and took most of the lives. Uh, and that we were working on that well before the 2012 hurricane season. Isaac, Debbie, Sandy, all just give us more motivation to push that across the finish line. Uh, I'll talk about that again in, in a minute. So just uh, kind of summarizing what went on during Sandy, and I'll run out of time here, but uh, media and emergency management briefings began when Sandy was still in the Caribbean for the U.S. East Coast, continued until well after final landfall. I made history during Sandy. I briefed the President of the United States on snowfall in West Virginia as the director of the National Hurricane Center. We were talking well after the event because we had strong winds over Lake Michigan and water levels there. Uh, it was a multi-hazard event that required uh, 
constant briefing updates. We at the Hurricane Center were on the horn with, with folks up in D.C. at the Weather Service Operations Center. We were talking to the states. We were on FEMA VTCs. Here's kind of a list of the things that went on. The FEMA VTCs, the presidential briefings. We were on the phone with New York City for hours and hours because that Saturday night going into Sunday morning, our confidence in a really significant storm surge event was increasing and our forecast numbers were going up. And uh, we spent a lot of time on the phone. Uh, going through all the nuances uh, about what our forecast was saying for what areas, helping them through that very difficult decision-making process. Direct, direct briefings with the WFOs, local state emergency managers. We did data and decision support to FEMA to help them on uh, pre-disaster declarations. Uh, a lot of media conference calls where you heard me saying some of the same things over and over again about the hazards and the storm surge and regardless of what kind of system it is. Uh, so we did everything that we would normally do in any kind of hurricane event. So this is just a, a snapshot, just to leave you with, uh, this is my next to last slide, of what a storm surge warning could kind of look like. We, next couple of years, are gonna be working through this idea. The proposal that went through the NOAA hurricane meeting at the end of November was that uh, by 2015, we would have a storm surge warning uh, available to the public. Uh, and that means a couple of years to get us all ready for that. Uh, so we'll see what the feedback is from folks like you during this off season from the emergency managers to see if we really set those things into place for the next two hurricane seasons. But basically what it would be is to warn for the areas that are actually at risk for significant storm surge flooding that could take lives and cause damage and have the warning in place in places where the hazards actually going to occur. Um, it is remarkable, if you think about it, that for the storm surge hazard, like we saw in Isaac and Sandy and Katrina and Rita, on and on, that there's not a warning specifically for that hazard in the places where it's going to occur. We've been covering it with the hurricane warning uh, for a long time. And so the idea is that we've been working on for a long time with social scientists helping out uh, that uh, we would move toward the storm surge warning. A lot of social science input has gone into this and it's very, been very positive. Last thing I'll leave you with. Uh, this is another snapshot of what this potential storm surge inundation graphic could look like. This has gone through more social science input and iteration than any weather service product I can personally think of. There might be some, but in the tropical arena anyway that I'm aware of, we've never done it this way, where we've taken a product, gone through this GIS environment, which is new for us in, in how we develop a product. Uh, doing it in that environment so that it could be scientifically valid, so that someday it could be slurped into an emergency management GIS environment. In the meantime, a graphic that emergency managers, uh, people in the public, the media have provided feedback on. We have tinkered with the colors. We have tinkered with how to explain it back and forth. And now we're getting close, I think, to maybe by this season being able to send something out like this, but not sending it out until we, after we have gone through this uh, process and, and not presuming that we know how to do it and how to design the product. So uh, this, we hope, will support eventual storm surge warning and the emergency managers can overlay this with their evacuation zones, making evacuation decision making a little bit easier. And the folks in the media, I hope, will be able to take something like this, either in graphical or eventual uh, more complicated data format, show it on television to show people who's in, who's out of the areas vulnerable to storm surge. So this is just kind of real world stuff in decision support in the Weather Ready Nation, helping out emergency managers. And there's a lot we could talk about, the details of Sandy, there's a lot of other things we could talk about, uh, but that's what I wanted to highlight today. I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you, Dave, for the opportunity to participate in this great event. And I look forward to sticking around, at least until tomorrow morning, to talk about this some more. Thank you. Emergency managers are going to be looking at it to make their evacuation decisions. And this gets, this takes really good science and shows people who's at risk. And is, this isn't the warning. This is the, this is the impact. This is how much flooding above ground level. So anyway. Quick operational question. Yeah. We keep giving kudos to the Euro on Sandy. But didn't Euro, I know it had the left-hand turn for anybody else, but it, it did have the left-hand turn into the southeastern U.S. at one point. And then eventually it got the, better, the, better. Euro, the European was farther left than the GFS five, six days out, but they all shifted left, and the European ended up shifting left or south of the eventual landfall point. So, yes, it, it wasn't perfect. It just right. it, it, it forecast the turn a little earlier than the GFS did, but the GFS did rather well 
at 24, 48, 72 hours right. in Sandy, even maybe a little better than the European. I'll have to go back and look at the numbers once we finalize our track, but. You almost hit it right Thank on, you. didn't it? Yeah. I had a, uh, a quick question, um, just to let everybody know too, after mine we'll take one more question because we're running a little bit over, uh, but uh, this is a very popular session, so a lot of people are watching online as well. Um, this is Dave Jones with Storm Center Communications. I just had a question if uh, maybe uh, Rick and Chris could address the importance of the satellite uh, data in uh, helping to predict where Sandy made landfall and ultimately the value of satellites and in going into numerical weather prediction as a whole. You want to tackle that one? Sure. I, I, to start out first, uh, that would be a I wish Dr. Uccellini were here to, uh, to address this because they're doing some studies on the value of it. I don't have those numbers at hand with me, but I know it's an important component of what we do. Now, Rick, in terms of uh, forecasting this for Sandy, in terms, I, I don't know if you have any preliminary information on that or? No, I, I want to wait till our full analysis yeah. of the event is, is over so we have the actual track and the verification numbers are, are, are really accurate from the models and the, and the humans. But long term, we have been utilizing a whole host of satellite data, not just the pictures you see on television and, uh, and uh, for our forecasters, but the data over the data sparse oceans from the satellites going into the computer models is a good part of what has helped overall forecasting, including tropical cyclone track forecasting to improve uh, over the last many years. Uh, in any individual case, if you do what we call data denial studies, you take out some of the satellite data, rerun it, and see if it would have been better or worse with or without the satellite data, you can make a determination what the impact of the satellite data uh, was. Um, you know, f for Sandy, for Isaac, for Debbie, you might get different answers. So you know, why don't we uh, go back and take a look at all the events from this year and, and see what we get once we do our full analysis. But the satellite data are critical, not just for looking at but for data going into the models. One more question. Uh, Bill Evans, WABC TV in New York. Um, first of all, I want to say fantastic job on only 75 deaths in New York City when you have a city of 13 million. Um, the evacuations were great when you consider you've got to evacuate the affirmed so from sure coastal remember. areas. Yeah. But the one problem I think, and the reason why we're all in this business, is that we are public servants. And the number one thing that we should think of going forward is the person that we're trying to get our message to. And I think we kind of lost that in the mechanics, the, the synoptics of the storm a little bit, because people did not understand storm surge. So my questions are this for the, for the ready nation, which we have a lot to do, because in New York City, as you know, the last major storm we had was 38. And there's very little of any, um, uh, people have no uh, experience with these storms. So when you have a storm of that magnitude, you have to make these things very simple for the public to understand. People live at two feet, four feet, six feet sea level, as you guys know. So when you're trying to explain storm surge to a mayor who totally screwed that up on television, there should have been a better explanation of how storm surge works from our National Weather Service office to the OEMs in New York City to the mayor. The mayor said, well, the storm surge is not going to be that bad. It's going to be around three to six feet. Well, it's three to six feet on top of astronomical high tide on top of the waves that you're talking about. So somebody who lives at two and four feet needs to know that that's really 12, 13 feet. So I think that was a message that was not clear to a lot of residents. But a lot of people in Staten Island perished because of, of that reason. Uh, my question about the storm ready situation is our National Weather Service office was not storm ready. We were not in very good communication with them. We needed more from them in terms of local storm surge, times that this was going to happen, and then their briefings with the National the Weather Service Office with the OEM in New York City and the mayor. Um, we're not, it doesn't seem all that chain of communication was very clear. So how do you move forward? And, and part of your presentation was fantastic, saying you've got to have some people in the office who are going to be out there communicating because our communications were not very good with our local office. Pretty much after a while, we ignored the local office and we paid attention, of course, to the hurricane center. And we did not have a great relationship and I'm hoping we can improve that and I'm wondering where we're gonna go from there. If, if I may, if, on the first part of it, in terms of the education on storm surge, I agree. Uh, one of the efforts we're looking at is possibly partnering with the American Meteorological Society 
put together a short course on some of these topics that would be for elected officials, would be for emergency managers, to first educate them on exactly what is storm surge, what, what does it mean, so then they could go out to their constituents and the, the people that work, that live in their area, to help explain too, and also from a weather, weather service perspective, people need to know where do you live, what is your elevation, how is this going to affect you. Uh, from my perspective, I've been doing this for 34 years, and it's 34 years ago you didn't hear much about storm surge. It was a different animal. So this is coming around now, and I think we need to, to take a look at how do you educate and get the word out to the public about what this is. Regarding the New York, I, I was not aware. Uh, I will go ahead and go back and take a look. I think that the assessment will probably tackle some of this. Uh, I do know that in the midst of a, a situation like that, sometimes it, it's difficult with the communications. We did have people, we have 20 people from across the region, across that northeast corridor, deployed in with emergency managers. I heard from uh, Nassau County, Suffolk County. I heard from New York City uh, Emergency Management. They all had people embedded. But uh, I would suggest, uh, I'd like to pull off and talk with you a little bit more and see how we can fix this. And I think for us too, as I said, as we go forward as a National Weather Service into this decision support, every event that goes by, we find out more and more about ways that we can do things in the future. So we'd like to use this opportunity to, uh, to even improve uh, more on our operations. So thank you. Can I quickly comment? Yes, sure. Okay. The social science work that we've done recently in, in conjunction with the uh, development of these products has made it crystal clear. I think we kind of already knew this, but the, the data show that the vast majority of the public don't understand the storm surge hazard, don't understand if they are in an evacuation zone. We've got to make those evacuation zones throughout the country famous so people know for sure if they're vulnerable to that hazard in the first place so that they take preparation for that hazard in the off-season seriously. Uh, the, the product here, though, one of the reasons for developing this and going pushing toward a storm surge warning is because both of those things I think are worth a bazillion words each. All of the, 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 the confusion over the storm surge could be lessened if there are easy graphical ways and with warnings to communicate the hazard in real time. Then you, everybody be looking at the same thing. And the problem with storm surge, one of the problems has been we haven't had a whole host of graphical products and warnings to go along with the text products and the local WFO products, and we're making effort to change that. So uh, even though part of the equation is improving the relationships between people and the communications between people and agencies, part of it really is the, the science and the technical development that leads to new products and warnings, because when you have those tools in place, the communication will go a lot better. That sounds great. I'd like to, uh, let's give our speakers a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. It's a terrific session. Thank you all very much. What we're going to do uh, for our online audience, we're going to take uh, about a 13-minute break or so. We're going to try to be back here at uh, uh, maybe 10.30, little 10.35 here, uh, mountain time. And uh, we've also gotten some uh, input uh, from discussions online that some of you are see seeing the stream that's a little uh, choppy. Um, we're checking the signals out going out from here. We think they're uh, going out okay, but we're constantly looking at that. And again, um, the gentleman that uh, just spoke this morning uh, will be back at 1.30 this afternoon uh, to answer questions that you may have online. So the online audience, we invite you to come in and ask those questions. So um, I'll leave you with uh, a little video about Breckenridge uh, so you can see a little bit about uh, what goes on out here. Meantime, we'll be back here at about uh, uh, 10.35 Mountain Time. Thank you for joining us for this session. And then uh, Bob Rutledge from the Space Weather Prediction Center uh, will join us with a fascinating talk about space weather and our vulnerabilities. So we'll be back in just a few moments. <laughs>